the last video, what we did is we looked at the setup, at least, of the mechanism of a caspase. And caspases, as you might recall, are the enzymes that induce apoptosis when the cell decides that it needs to commit suicide. Okay, often done in times of DNA damage and so forth. Okay, and caspase is sort of an abbreviation for C-terminal aspartate protease. And if you need any review or you haven't seen that video, certainly go back and watch it. It should be the one right before this in the playlist. Okay, and what we determined is that um, that caspases specifically target. Um, the C-terminal peptide bond that's adjacent to the alpha carbon of aspartate residues, okay? And specifically, the alpha carbon that we're talking about is this one right there that I've highlighted in purple, okay? And what you must remember about proteases is that they're specifically targeting a carboxylic acid derivative known as an amide bond, okay? They're targeting the amide bond, and specifically, let me do this in red, the bond that they're targeting is this one right here. So that's the bond that's going to be broken by the caspase. And in general, with all proteases, that's the bond that's going to be broken. What you have to decide is, is it going to be the bond that's on the C-terminal side of the alpha carbon, or is it the one on the N-terminal side? And usually the name of the enzyme sort of gives that away. Now, one other thing that we also have to keep in mind, and I haven't drawn it here just for the sake of space, but what we also have to keep in mind is that there's a carbonyl of the peptide backbone that has a partial negative charge on the carbonyl oxygen, and there's a partial positive on this proton that's on the histidine. And then, of course, there is an electrostatic interaction between the partial negative and the partial positive. And that electrostatic hydrogen bonding contributes to holding that histidine residue in a proper orientation so that it can deprotonate the cysteine residue, and we have to keep that in mind. Okay. Well, the first step of the mechanism is going to be deprotonation of the cysteine residue. And as soon as it gets deprotonated, the electrons between the proton and the sulfur atom go and attack this carbonyl carbon right here. That forces these pi electrons onto the carbonyl oxygen, okay? And what you end up generating is this particular, this particular intermediate right here, called a tetrahedral intermediate, okay? Um, when you start with a trigonal planar complex and you do a nucleophilic acyl substitution, which is what this is, your intermediate is always termed a tetrahedral intermediate. And ordinarily, if you're attacking a carbonyl, which is normally what's done, um, you should get a negatively charged oxygen like you see here, okay? And notice now how here, if this is our caspase, the rest of our caspase, the caspase through the cysteine residue is now covalently attached to the, pro the protein that it's attacking, which in the, in the case of a caspase would be another caspase ordinarily. Okay. Now we have this tetrahedral intermediate. It's quickly going to collapse, and as it does, the pi bond here is going to reform. Okay. So the electrons that are on that that alkoxide, the oxygen of the tetrahedral intermediate, those electrons reform the pi bond and it kicks off the leaving group. And in this case, the leaving group is going to be this amine right here. Okay, so this amine is going to leave. And as it does, it's going to pick up this proton from the histidine, regenerating the resting state of that histidine residue. Now, what you may notice, and let me come over here and do this, what you may notice is that when the amine leaves, right, it's going to leave like this. It's going to leave instead of the two hydrogens on it and then the rest of the group over here, right? And you say that the, the amine only has two hydrogens, which makes it have a neutral charge. But very quickly, once it leaves the active site, it, there's going to be a proton exchange with solution and it will pick up an extra proton. Okay, and it will end up like this. Okay, so don't worry about that proton so much. It's not as important, but just know that when it leaves the active site, it will pick up a proton from solution. Okay, now we have the regenerated resting state of the histidine residue, and we're clear for another deprotonation. And the molecule that we're going to deprotonate is going to be water. 
Okay, so here's our water molecule, and what's going to happen is there's this lone pair on this shift base of the histidine, and it's going to attack this proton, and it's going to deprotonate water, and the, the electrons between the proton and the oxygen come out, and they attack this particular carbonyl carbon, generating a second tetrahedral intermediate. Okay. Once we generate that tetrahedral intermediate, again, it's quickly going to collapse back. So these electrons that are this lone pair that's on the alkoxide side of the tetrahedral intermediate, they're going to reform the pi bond and they're going to kick off the best leaving group, which in this case is the cysteine residue. So cysteine leaves and as it does, it picks up the proton that came from water that's on the histidine and that regenerates the resting state of the histidine residue. Now, if you remember Remember from our amine when that was the leaving group, right? It left as R and H2, which is neutral, and it picked up a proton from solution, right, to generate the state of amines at physiological pH, right? Well, the carboxylate is going to do a similar thing. Notice how here it exists as a carboxylic acid um, through the mechanism of the enzyme. However, the carboxylic acid is very quickly going to do another proton exchange with with solution and you're going to generate the carboxylate version of the rest of the protein okay so notice here we have the carboxylate version okay and notice also because it's a c-terminal protease okay the aspartate has a free carboxyl terminus okay now what I also want to show you about the protease mechanisms is this. It's actually very sequential when you get to, to think about it. Okay? This, goes for, this goes for both cysteine proteases and serine proteases. Notice what's happening. We deprotonate the nucleophile, nucleophilic attack, generation of tetrahedral intermediate. Okay? Then pi bond reforms and we lose a leaving group. Right? In fact, what we're doing is we're just doing nucleophilic acyl substitutions from organic two. Okay? And the same thing's going to happen again. Deprotonate the nucleophile, nucleophilic attack, generation of tetrahedral intermediate, uh, pi bond reforms, and we get our leaving group. Okay? So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuitive sense on the caspase mechanism. Okay? And we could also do um, a serian protease mechanism, in which case this group right here, I'll do it in orange, this group would be an oxygen hydrogen group. Okay? In other words, it would be an alcohol, a hydroxyl group, because our amino acid would be serine. Okay? But one thing you should know between serine proteases and cysteine protease mechanisms is that the only difference, the only difference between them is this atom right here, all you would do between the mechanisms is you replace this with oxygen, okay? an oxygen atom. If you replace it with oxygen atom, then it becomes a serine protease mechanism. But that's the only difference between them. You're still going to have generation of two tetrahedral intermediates, two leaving groups, and all that business. Okay? Your first leaving group is always going to be the amine. Okay, that's always your first leaving group is the amine. Your second leaving group is going to be the actual residue that initially attacked. If it was a serine protease, your leaving group would be serine as it picks up a proton from the histidine. In this case, our leaving group is cysteine as it picks up a proton from the histidine residue. Okay, I hope that makes sense. See you in the next video.